but welcome to speeding up WordPress. So before we get started, real quick, I do quite a bit of things. So since we're late, I'm not going to dive into all this, but I teach web development, and I also own an agency that we create digital marketing products, such as plugins and various SaaS apps, as well as an agency side where we have clients. So, so let's get to the actual why we're here. So why does speed matter? Has anyone heard that speed matters for SEO? Has anyone heard that before? OK, yes. That's a huge factor. When it comes to SEO, almost every search engine optimization, almost every search engine, almost everything out there has speed as a factor. So that's a really big factor. But maybe you don't care about that for whatever reason. It also, many, many studies have shown that your conversion rate is also dependent on speed. So for example, if you're selling something or you're trying to get someone to sign up for your email list, or you're trying to get them to download your ebook or do something on your website, for every second, you have a drastic decrease in the amount of people that do what you want them to do. So in today's session, we're going to go over things you can do to speed up your website. So, and I already mentioned that, so we'll go on. So when it comes to conversions, there's a few stats I just want to throw at you real quick. Walmart found that when page load increased to four seconds, conversions decreased dramatically. So even four seconds reduces your time frame. Now, Google hopes you to be loading under a second. That is what they look for. A lot of us are probably not there yet, but that is the goal, is to get it loading less than a second. Now, 79% of dissatisfied customers will not come back if the site is slow. So if you have a slight site, and it sounds really interesting, they try to go to it, and it's really slow, four out of five people will not try to go back later. They'll see it, they're like, oh, I don't want to go to that site. That site's slow, and they'll move on. 47% of customers expect pages to load within two seconds. So if you test your site and you're at three or four seconds, then you're losing over half the people that could be going to your website. And then lastly, 16% are willing to wait up to five seconds on a mobile page. So if your site is taking a while to load, most people on mobile phone will leave your website. So those are some numbers to help back up why we care about speed. So hopefully that's somewhat convincing since we're rushed through that part. But if not, it is really important to have your site fast, and that's why we're focusing on it today. So <coughs> the very first thing we need to do before you can actually know what you need to do to improve your site is to figure out how fast it is and what it's, what it's currently performing at. And to do that, there's a few tools we can use to figure that out. So on the screen, I have a couple tools that are listed. These are my personal favorites, but there's actually hundreds of them if you were to Google or Bing or DuckDuckGo website speed test, you're going to find hundreds of them. But the ones that tend to be the better ones are the ones listed on the screen. So we have Pingdom. And this is a nice free tool. It's tools.pingdom.com. GT Metrics is nice. It's gtmetrics.com. They also have a WordPress specific test. So if you enable the WordPress option there, they'll give you some data and tips based around WordPress sites. So that's really handy. Google PageSpeed Insights. This is really nice because it's by Google. So they know what they're looking for for their search engine. So probably the things they're highlighting there is probably things they care about in their search results. So that's one that I like to use as well. Lastly, if you're somewhat familiar with the developer tools in most browsers, they also have a speed test there. That's a little bit more technical, so I'm not going to go over that part today. But we are going to look at Pingdom in just a moment. Does anyone have questions on those before I dive into one of those? Any questions so far? All right, great. So if the internet's going to play, I'm going to attempt to run through one of these. And while that's loading, if it loads, most of these work exactly the same way. You just type in your, your URL and then hit scan. And they'll come back with a grade rating. So usually it's A or B or C or D or E or F. Sometimes it's on a 0 to 100 scale and it just gives you a number. Yes? Yes. So the Google Developer Tools, that's just, I don't think that's going to load, but the Google Developer Tools, what that does is just reloads the page using the browser itself. So your internet speed will play a factor there. Whereas these other three tools, they use their server to run it. So you're going to get slightly different numbers depending on what your internet connectivity is. It's good to probably do both if you know how to do both. It'd probably be best to do both. But that, that, does that answer your question? OK, great. So we'll let that run. We'll just jump back to the slides for now and see if it ever comes up. So when it comes to these numbers or grade scale they're going to give you, they're going to give you a variety of things that you need to look into. 
And those are, we're going to go over some of those terms today, but the very first thing that matters when it comes to speed is your hosting. If you go and find hosting on a provider that advertises 99 cents a month or free, you're probably not going to have a fast site. So speed matters a lot, and hosting providers know that. And the really good ones maintain their servers, and they give you really good resources. They do a lot of things. But if you're paying for really cheap hosting or free hosting, they're not doing that for your site. So that's something to consider. Now, you can get inexpensive hosting for relatively cheap from good companies. Most of the sponsors here have plans starting at 5 or $6 a month. So you don't have to spend hundreds to get good hosting, but if you're spending a dollar or 99 cents, it's probably not going to be good hosting. And when it comes to this, I'm not going to get super technical right here, but when it comes to hosting, when you're looking at it, things like the bandwidth levels, the resources, the RAM, the memory, um, even the site storage and the type of storage it's on, all of those numbers matter. So if you're looking at hosting and you're comparing different numbers and one says maybe two cores, one says eight cores, you don't have to actually understand how all these work, but knowing the higher the number is usually better means more resources are behind your website. So for example, you might not know exactly how the memory works, but if something says, oh, you have 512 megabytes, and the other one says you have five gigs, that's good. Usually the higher is better. Same thing with the cores, same thing with a lot of the other numbers. So looking for higher capacity servers in your hosting plan will help tremendously in the long run. A lot of the things we're going to go over is going to help a lot, but having good hosting should always be the very first step. Does that make sense? Does anyone have questions on that? Does anyone want to ask about a particular hosting provider? I don't want to recommend one because I know there's a lot of people, but I, yes? They're OK. I've had really bad experiences with them, but they are a really good sponsor in the space, so I don't want to say really bad things. But they're OK. They're, not, they're definitely not the worst, but they're OK. <laughs> luckily, luckily, the ones that I consider the worst are not sponsors today. So I can say one pa the iPage and one-on-one -on -one tend to be the worst in speed tests and security tests and everything else you can think of. And they're the ones that advertise 99 cents a month, hence why I throw out those. But as long as you're not on those two, usually you're at least a step up. Yes? That's a good one. It's a little bit costlier, so I don't know. That might not be in everyone's budget. But WP Engine, if you're looking for like the best, the managed, host, managed WP hosts tend to be really good. So Pagely, WP Engine, Flywheel, um, A2 Hosting starting up their own version. So those tend to be really good on the higher end, but they also are a little bit pricier. So that depends on your budget. Did anyone have a? Yes. I'm sorry? Liquid Web's really good too. So most of the ones that you see around the WordCamps tend to be really good. So we see Liquid Web a lot. We see uh, DreamHost is OK. And we see it. So most of those tend to be OK. Pressable is a really good one. Yes. That one's a good, that's a good mid-tier one. So for the, for the price, it's really good. So that, that one's OK. Hey, Frank? Yes. So you know, a lot of these providers have multiple levels. And, and what's interesting is, so we look at this lower one, and we go, wow, $3.95 a month. Well, the middle one, that's $6.95 a month. That's like double the cost. $6.95, I mean, come on, people, you know. <laughs> Let's spend $10 a month, or $15 or $20. You're, you're paying for better performance. And so we think, well, you know, this one's twice as expensive, and we're talking about dollars here. So, yeah, exactly. When it comes to depending on your budget, that's why I try to throw in a variety of options. Like um, SiteGround starts off six ninety five a month, and then DreamHost and Bluehost are like four ninety five a month. So if your budget's non existent or really small, those are going to be okay. If that's what your budget is, those are fine. But if you can, if this business matter is like, super important to you and you're making some money off of it, getting going on a slightly higher plan is probably a good idea. But I'm not going to say you have to do that because not everyone has that kind of budget. So just to clarify. What about cloud hosting versus Unreal Engine? I, mean, I don't really know why. So there's a lot of terms with hosting. And when I, I've given talks on hosting before, and it's like entire talks around types of hosting. So I'm going to just in a quick soundbite answer. You have a variety of different types of hosting. So you have shared hosting. You have um, VPS. You have dedicated virtual. They have a whole other term for it. Then manage hosting and dedicated servers. Each one has an extra level of resources and dedication to your site. So when you're on shared hosting, such as on HostGator or the lower tiers of Bluehost and DreamHost, then if you have some site and a person next to you has some site and they have a lot of traffic one day, they're using some of your resources, slowing down your website. So that's where shared hosting then is, can be a downside, but they're also the cheapest. So depending on what your budget, it's a great place to get started, as long as you're on, on, on a OK host. And then once you can move up to something such as the, they use cloud, but almost technically all of these are in the cloud. So it really, it's a loose definition there. 
So, but if you can transition up to a more virtual system, so like SiteGround has dedicated virtual virtualization, so your resources aren't being used by other people's resources. And some of the higher plans on like Bluehost and Dreamhost, they have those as options. So that would be where you would move up into one of those better ones, depending on what your budget is. But what, when you see the word cloud, that's such a thrown around term. That's every some people even label like shared hosting as cloud or dedicated servers. So don't worry about that term. I would ignore that term in most cases. Any other questions on hosting before we go to the next? Oh yes. Can say a word about WordPress.com. Say the business version of that. So WordPress.com is a slightly different beast when it comes to hosting. They're really good in terms of if you had to have a map of all the different hosting providers, WordPress.com would be at least in the middle, if not higher. So they're, they're an okay one, depending on what your goals are with the business. Last one. That one's a really fun one. It's a little bit more technical, so not everyone's going to be able to jump into that one. But that's good. Usually, when it comes to S3, um, SES, and Light Sail, and all of the Amazon properties, they tend to be really good. So after you establish some hosting provider that you are comfortable with and you think they're going to be fast, the next major factor is your theme. And this is a fun number. If you have a good theme and you have a bad theme, a bad theme can make your site four times as slow as the good theme equivalent. So that's massive. If your site could be loading under a second and you switch to a bad theme, now it's loading at four seconds. Now 84% of the mobile users are leaving your site. So that's a dramatic change that's really important. So when it comes to themes, you want to select a good theme. Finding theme, quality theme providers, so I listed three, but these are just three out of hundreds, so don't feel like you have to use these exact three, but I wanted to list some examples. Finding a good theme developer or a good theme agency is very important. Now, when it comes to repository, you don't really, if you're finding a free theme, it's not something that you could easily be like, oh, who's this developer? What's the quality? There's a little bit more to it than that. So the thing I suggest is running the theme demos through one of those speed tests. So almost every theme you find, whether it's on ThemeForest or repository, they usually have a site somewhere set up as a demo. So if you run that through a speed test and compare that to another theme's demo, you can speed test both those and see if maybe one's potentially faster. Now the issue is that there's a lot of factors at play there. There's their own hosting provider, maybe some options they have. So it's not an exact one-to-one -one test, but that's a great way to get started in comparing themes when it, in terms of speed. Does that make sense, everyone? Yes. I haven't played with it yet because it's fairly new. But when it comes to Studio Press, usually I trust most of the things they do. Me too. I just wanted to know what you But I haven't personally played with it, so I don't have any data for you. Oh, any question on testing a theme or what to look for? To, yes. When you say elegant themes, are you talking about Divi? Yes, the Divi builder line. So the company's elegant themes, so I just list that as. So most of the themes there tend to be really good as well. Yes. Do you have a URL of the speed test? So a few slides ago, I had the four listed. So you could do the pingdom and enter the URL from the theme demo, is what I'm referring to. OK, OK. But I was, OK. Somebody else had mentioned before about it tested. I guess it really tests more about whether the theme is following good practices. Yeah, so there's a, there's a plugin and a couple of things out there that test like the quality of code. It tends to be a little bit more technical, so I don't want to throw out too many terms that are a little confusing. So, but if you're interested, we can maybe chat afterwards. So the theme, now when it comes to the actual theme features, since there's so many different themes and they all have different functions, I can't dive into every single particular theme right now. But the first thing to test is that speed test and then going from there. And then a couple of things to remember is usually if a theme has more features and more customizations, there's a lot more processing going on in the background, meaning they'll probably be slower. So when it comes to themes and you're picking out themes, it's better in most cases to choose one theme that does something really well, one like a photography theme, and ever, they only have photography, as opposed to a general purpose theme that has thousands upon thousands of options. Because when you configure all those different options, now it has to process all those options when you're loading the page. Now, not all things. Some themes do things really well. The Avada theme, for example, has thousands of options. And they do things a little bit different, so they're better than some of the more general purpose themes. So that's not all themes are bad in that case. But it would be something to consider. More features it has means more processing it has to do, meaning it generally could be slower than a single purpose theme. Does that make sense? Yes? So AVADA, it's the, one of the most popular premium yeah. themes out there. And 
Yes. I don't personally like it, but I know it's so popular, so I try not to say anything bad against it. Yeah, I mean, it's but, but what's nice, they're much better now. Two years ago, they had all the code would run all of the time, so it was a really bad theme. But since then, they've more modularized it, so you can turn off entire feature sets. So that's a good step. They're, they'll never be faster than a single purpose thing, though, because of those options. But they are, when it general purpose, they're one of the better ones. Any questions on that before I? Yes. Could you just read the theme that you've got there for those of us who can't see? Oh, sure. So the three examples I had listed were Studio Press, Elegant Themes, and iThemes. Now, iThemes has started to discontinue their themes. They're moving away from themes. So that was, but those are three as an example. Usually those are good quality. But there's lots of good quality ones out there, too. So any questions on themes before we? Page builders are a really big topic right now, so I don't want to okay. say too many negative things there, but th it could, depending on how much you have going on, on the site. And so some of them, if you went crazy and built out a massive page with page builders that all have all these extra options and all this, it could have an issue, as opposed to something that's just typed into like the regular editor. But it really depends on the page builder and exactly what you're creating. So not always would be the answer there. Any questions on themes before we go to the next? Yes. Well, so well, Divi is technically two different things. So there's a Divi theme system, and then there's a Divi builder. So the Divi builder is one of the better page builders. So don't I'm not saying page builders are bad. Page builders are okay. I was just they could be used incorrectly if you went crazy with it. Is what my point there. But any questions on themes before I guess? Uh, Page builders are a really lengthy conversation. It really depends on how you're using it and what specifically page builder you're using. In general, page builders are OK. I don't want to say page builders are a bad idea. Like in general, they're OK. Just I wouldn't get carried away with all the different configurations you could do there would be my only warning there. But in general, they're OK to use, just to clarify. Did that help the answer there? Did that give you an answer? No, the question was relative to the theme itself. So the page builders. They kind of sit on top of the theme. So usually, as long as your theme's OK, it w doesn't, there's not a significant difference between using one theme or another with a page builder. That doesn't usually make much of a difference as long as it makes a difference theme-wise, but not interacting with page builder-wise. So that, that aspect wouldn't matter as much as comparing two themes against each other. So does that answer your question? OK, great. Anything else on themes before we go to the next? OK. So the next question I get asked all the time is, how many plugins are too many? And, and I'm sure you've had that question, or, you, or you've heard that question. It's a really popular question in the WordPress space. And the answer is, there is no right answer there. Because every site is different, and every plugin is different. So for example, if you had a plugin that gives you a single shortcode, it's a really small plugin. You could have hundreds of those, and it would barely affect your performance. Whereas if you have something like WooCommerce, or a Jetpack, or something that's much more meatier, and you had 100 of those type of plugins, your site would be so slow no one could use it. So it really depends on the type of plugin. An average site averages around 20 to 30 plugins. So if you're well under that, then you're probably OK. Now, if you're well over that, then you probably want to ask this question, do you need that plugin? So almost every plugin you have out there, I'm sure you could say, oh, I really love that. I love that someone can see an animated icon as I go. You probably don't need that, though. Every plugin you add adds a performance issue with your website, even if it's a really tiny one. But it does have something there. It loads extra files. It loads extra processing. So every plugin you add can affect your performance. So the least amount you can use, the better. Now, you don't have to delete all your plugins, but having less is better than having more. But there is no right answer to how many should I have. And I think I pretty much said that. So if you do not use a plugin often, deactivate it. So if it's something that you use once a year or once every six months, don't even leave it running if you can avoid it. You could just deactivate it, and that way you don't have to worry about it until you go to use it again, depending on the exact plugin. So for example, if you have a plugin that manages a contest for whatever reason, and you only run that contest once every six months, then there's no reason to really have that performance conflict on your site the, all those other times when you only run it that one day every six months, depending on the type of contest, naturally. So, and then the other thing is then if you don't use it at all, go ahead and just delete it. So every, all the code on your site, if you leave it active and you're not using it ever, then just go ahead and delete it. There's no reason to have that going against your performance. 
Does that make sense? I know, I know saying there is no right answer is not the best thing you're probably looking for, but is that any questions on maybe plugins or what you're after? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So there's a few different answers there. For in terms of speed, no. So in terms of speed, if it's not active, that code's not being run, it's not doing anything processing. But in terms of security and all these other things, it's probably best practice still to delete it if you're not using it. But in terms of speed, there's no performance thing. Yes? Uh, a, a little bit. We're going to go over a couple things in just a moment that are directly applicable. But when it comes to WooCommerce, there's a lot of other factors at play. So there's a little bit more things you could do beyond the stock. But there's quite a bit in the rest of the stock that are still directly applicable. Any questions on plugins before we? OK. What do you think about page builder plugins? I'm just going to say So, <laughs> so when it comes to after we worry about our hosting, we worry about our themes, we looked at the plugins a little bit. The next major step is something called caching. How many people have never heard of caching before? Is that a thing that some people? OK. Do you know exactly what it is for those who don't? Do you? OK, a little bit. OK. So in caching, unfortunately, it's this word that people use a lot in a lot of different settings. So it doesn't always mean the same thing. But in a, in a very basic definition is that it creates versions of a page and resources that can load a little bit faster instead of having to run through processing. So there's a lot more technical jargon that I could throw in there. But in a very basic version, it creates a copy or some version of resources that don't have to run through processing. So for example, every time you go to your website, if you went to your home page right now without caching, then it has to load up. It has to pull out the data from the database. It has to pull out the content of the page. It has to bring out the title. It has to process your layout. It has to do all this processing stuff in order to show that page. So caching at a few different levels will run all that processing and then create a copy of that and go, hey, here's the final version. So anytime that anyone goes to your website, they go, oh, here's the final version. We don't have to go through that, all that processing again. So it can remove all that processing step and only show them the final version. So that's a caching in a nutshell. Does that make sense before I go into some more examples? OK. So when it comes to caching, there's a few different levels of caching. So for example, there's server level caching. So this is sort of what I was just explaining, where something makes a copy of the final version of your page. So depending on who you host with, they may have this enabled. This is not something that we usually do ourselves, unless you're managing your, host, um, your server environment yourself. But a lot of the higher end hosting providers will do this set for you, but not always. And so what server caching will do is almost exactly what I was saying, where they monitor your pages, and they make direct copies of it. And then if someone tries to go to a particular page, they'll send them that copy instead of having run through all the processing. And then when you make a change, sometimes the server caching will do something called purge the cache for that page. And that's where they'll run through that process again to create a new copy of that page to make it much faster just sending that page instead of running the processing. Does that make sense? Is that confusing to anybody? So if, I have the if you have the option, server cache is really great because it's outside of the WordPress ecosystem. But most people, and most everyday hosts, that's not an option for most people. So if you have the option, that's a great thing to look into, like uh, Varnish and Memcache. And some, but it's a bit technical, so not everyone can do that route. Bluehost has it as part of their Bluehost plugin. Yeah, there's some hosts, like I said, some of them will do it. And that's a, a great avenue to pursue. Now, if you can't do it, there's some plugins that'll do this at the WordPress level. So they'll do this same exact concept, except whereas the server, how the server is different is that the server doesn't have to load WordPress to send that copy. Whereas a plugin, some of WordPress still has to load in order for the plugin to load to send that copy. So there's a slight decrease in speed between server caching and plugin caching, but not much. It's a very nominal amount, and it really depends on the exact server configuration and plugin configuration which is well beyond the scope of this talk. But the three plugins that you probably have seen, it's, you've probably seen at least one of these at some point. It's W3 Total Cache, Super Cache, and Breeze. All three of these do pretty much the same exact thing, where you turn it on, and they'll start processing and creating the cached copies of your pages. Now, some of them have more finer controls, so such as W3, cat, to, W3 Total Cache and Super Cache have a bit more controls that you can say, oh, this page never cache, or this page always flush when I make a change. You have a little bit more control, where something like Breeze, it's usually you just turn it on, and it starts working. 
So it depends on what level you're looking for. You might want to experiment with the three different plugins. But most of them, the end goal is almost exactly the same between the three plugins. Did you have a question? Yes. Um, <laughs> I just went blank. Um, WordPress gives you the option to purge hashes uh, for times when you're editing a web page. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so when is a good time to purge caching or not? Well, just the thing to remember is when you purge cache, it has to run that process again. So it depends on how often you're editing and what you're changing. If you make changes, it's OK to go ahead and just purge the cache and for that page. If you pur um, to purge all the cache through the entire site, that's not something I would recommend doing often, depending on how much changes you're making. But usually, you, most of these and most servers, you can have just purge the cache for like an individual page. So you make a change on a page or a post. You would purge the cache for that, so it would remake that cached version of it. And it wouldn't, because these are done fairly quickly, it's not something that you have to schedule, oh, I need to wait till 2 AM to purge the cache. So that's not, it's not that level. So you could do it like as soon as you make the change, purge it, and then move on. Unless you have a really heavily traffic site, if you're talking like thousands of visitors a day or tens or hundreds of thousands, maybe you'd do it a little bit different. But for most people, you could just purge it once you make the change. Yes? I'm going to mention that in a few slides, actually. OK. Any other questions on that part so far? So the last one I wanted to briefly mention is browser caching. So I know it's not up there on the slide for a second, but browser caching isn't something that most of us have control over. But how browser caching works is when we open, in this case, Safari or Chrome or Opera or Internet Explorer or Edge or any of the other ones, some of them will do browser caching. And what this does is it downloads some of the files from your site and keep them within the browser. So the next time a user goes to your site, they only use the files local and they don't have to re-download them from your website. This is a natural process. Most browsers do this automatically. So it's not something you can really do or change. But that might every now and then you might make a change. And a user is like, oh, I don't see this change. And you'll have to ask them to empty their browser cache. And that's how that system works. It's not something that we usually interact with. These are something browsers do all themselves. But it's something to be aware of, just in case you do make a change, their browsers might still have the old change, depending on what you changed. So that'd be another thing to consider. Does that make sense with the caching? Yes. What about network traffic? So that's slightly more technical. So do you have a specific question about it, or you're just asking in terms of? I just noticed recently with my design Mm -hmm. So it's probably at plugin or server level. So the network level, it's not something. And there's lots of extra caching out. There's actually like object caching and database <laughs> caching. There's a lot more to caching than this brief example. So it could be at a variety of levels. But that would be a question for your hosting provider and just be like, hey, what's going on with the caching here? I can't seem to purge it. Mm -hmm. And they'll probably, because they have giant logs, they can just go, oh, well, this is what's going on, and we can fix that. That's probably where you should start with that question. Yes. So if you're using a plugin and you make changes to a site, I'm assuming the plugin will automatically. Depending on how you have it set up, by the default, most of them will yeah. think to purge yeah. content when you change it. But if not, most of these add a little like purge cache button, either on the page or in the admin toolbar, or somewhere that you can see when you're editing the page. So you would just click that button then. Well, unfortunately, it is, uh, I sometimes have to read it in my router. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's PHP. Sometimes it's the client's browser, my browser, the web. I mean, it's unfortunately, like, none of these systems, you would think they talk to each other, but they don't. Like, all these are independent caching. Yeah. So if you have a, like, where's this cache chat question, it could be a variety of places. So in most cases, it'd be just like clearing the plugin cache and then checking the server cache and just clearing out until you find it. And that's, yes, sir. Oh, I thought you had some feedback to that. I thought you had another. Yes. Sometimes, like with Rehost, if you use Cloudflare, if you use it for another host right. or whatever, but long story short, they, in their CDN, they got caching too. Yes. Unless you go out there to Cloudflare site. Now, we're going to mention CDNs in a moment, but yeah, that's another spot. So there's caching everywhere. So unfortunately, most sites that are just getting started, they only deal with these couple ones. But once you get to a, a more advanced level where you're doing it at your own and stuff, then you start dealing with all these extra level of caches. And unfortunately, there's no easy system to find out which one's still cached. I know that's probably not the answer you're hoping for, but. 
we do, definitely, because I experience that the same issue all the time. Any other question on caching before we move to offloading? Okay. So offloading. So like caching, so with caching, we have this system that it, it preprocesses everything, creates this cached copy that it can send to the browser. So offloading is similar to that, except instead of having it within your server or within your ecosystem, you're sending parts of your resources of your site, so images, files, things along those lines, to other places that might load faster than your own site. So for example, what is the first there? So for example, a CDN, if you've never heard this term before, this is an awesome system, but this is a content delivery network. This would be an example of offloading. So how content delivery networks work is they have a variety of servers across the world where they make copies of some of your files and store those all around the world. So for example, if, I live, if I'm here in Atlanta and I have a site hosted here in Atlanta and someone from Jacksonville, Florida tries to access that site, it just goes down the road and goes, here's the content. Well, if someone from um, Seattle or Japan tries to load the website currently, then it has to send that data all the way to Japan from Atlanta or all the way to Seattle. What a CDN does is they go, oh, hey, we have a server right down the street from you. Here, just here's your content here. So it makes their ver their, what they're receiving get received much faster than coming from your own site. So the CDN network just makes copies of these various files and stores them at various other servers around the world, whichever is closest to whoever's trying to view the content. Now, you can offload a variety of items. So the most popular thing is usually images. But if you have maybe a lot of PDFs or zips that you, for whatever reason, they can download or buy from you, that'd be another thing you could also offload. You could also do maybe styles or scripts. If you do a lot of heavy styling and scripting and things, you could also put those into CDNs or any other place. And so these would be examples of things that you could quote unquote offload. Now, there are a couple plugins that help you with this. So Amazon S3 and WP S3 offload, that's a huge mouthful. But that would be a really good option. That would offload it to the S3 system, which is in Amazon. So has everyone heard of S3 before? Is that a new term for anyone? OK. So S3, with Amazon, they have this huge, giant ecosystem of e-commerce where you go and buy stuff. But in reality, behind the scenes, they have this massive web development circle of tools. And one of these tools is something called S3, which is pretty much a collection of servers that can house files. So think of like a Dropbox or Google Drive but for web development purposes mostly. So this is a network of these servers, and they call it the S3. So that's a place that you can store some of your files. And there's quite a few plugins. This is one of the plugins that I use, Amazon S3 and WP S3 Offload. But if you search in the WordPress repository, there's lots and lots of plugins that do this sort of system. Now, depending on your hosting provider, some of them will have a CDN that you could use instead, and they'll handle that step for you. So for example, Flywheel, SiteGround, and a couple of the others, you just turn on the CDN option, and then they'll start doing this for you. So if you're interested in this, that would be the first step I would recommend is looking at your hosting provider and see if they offer that option. Some of it's for free, depending on what plan you're on. Sometimes it's just an extra upcharge. It just depends on the hosting provider you're with. But that would be a great first step. And then if they don't offer that, then find some offloading plugin, such as the one that's listed there. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, depending on, so for example, I'm going to mention like Cloudflare and Cloudfront and a couple of those. So if you're using anything like those, they also have this caching and CDN quite a bit of that built in. But we'll get to that in just a moment. But thank you. Yes? Usually, they're on special servers that are configured just for like sending files. So they're not worrying about all this extra processing going on. So they tend to be faster inherently, just because that's exactly what they're focused on. Not by like massive amounts. Not, you're, gonna, you're not going to offload and instantly be 20 times faster. But th it's because of their single use purpose. They're inherently a little bit faster and the proximi proximity as well. Because if, it, if you're designing, if we, someone here in Atlanta is designing a website for a local business, mm -hmm. Yeah, so they're still beneficial, just not as beneficial. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yep. Okay. If I'm on vacation in another town, sitting on the beach, and I'm like, you know, I, I do got to, I do got to get that kitchen remodeled, you know, this summer. What you do when I'm on vacation? Yeah. <laughs> what I do, but right, I could be in Colorado, and, and you know, let me let me reach that, you know, guy in Atlanta. So it makes sense. It's simple. It's a switch. Turn on the switch. 
I think you had a question first. So the 7PS3 is the plugin that offloads your stuff to Amazon S3. Is that yeah, the WPS3 offload plugin. Do you have a question? If you choose a different host, so for example, GoDaddy's Phoenix, I think. Right. I want to say they're in Phoenix. So if you're hosting on Phoenix and you're here and your clients are here and your customers are here, well, it's still having to go back and forth between here and Phoenix. So that'd be another thing to consider. Thank you. Yes. So if I'm using WordPress.com and my leaders are in Indonesia or in the middle of Africa or all over the place, is there, do I have to go to a different So WordPress.com, there is a CDN option, I want to say. I haven't used them recently, but I want to say they have a CDN option switch, just like most of the hosting providers. Okay. So you would check with them first. And then if not, then you would look into other CDN options, such as going to S3. Another popular one is Max CDN. Max, yes, yeah, Max CDN. That's very popular in the WordPress space. So that'd be another one to possibly look into as well. So the next big factor is images. And if you want to quickly speed up your site and you're very image heavy, then this step would be the answer. So the big question is, do your images have to be that big? And almost always, the answer is no. So in reality, 3 quarters of your users are viewing it from your phone. And it's about 400 pixels wide. So if you need to load the 5,000 pixel wide image, that's, you probably don't need that. So when it comes to images, the smaller the image file, the faster a page will load. So for example, if you go out with your nice brand new Nikon camera or Canon with that extra zoom and all these pixels, and you take a picture and it's like, wow, it's only 4.5 gig, gigabit file. We're just going to upload that. And then every user, it'll only take a half an hour to load my page. So you don't want to do that. So the smaller the file, the less data has to be transferred to the browser, the faster your page will load. So now there's no recommended number. Now a good number to aim for is like 100 kilobits or 200 kilobytes. But that's, it really depends on your site and the type of image you're after. So if you're trying to display a photo gallery and they're really high quality or a photographer, you probably want a little bit higher quality. If, you're someone, if it's just like icons, then that you know, it really depends on exactly what it's after. But the number to aim for is like 100 to 200 kilobytes or smaller, preferably much smaller. But that'd be a number to aim for. Definitely not anything megabytes. That would be massive. You probably don't want to do that. Do you have a question? I may be jumping the gun, but using the parallax feature, does that play a role? So if the image is too large and using that feature, does that play a role? So parallax is done usually mostly in front end code, so it's all within the browser. So depending on when that process gets started, it, it could be a factor, but it's not usually the image with the parallax that's the issue. So parallax and images, there are slightly different systems. They just use images. So changing the image size won't affect the parallax per se. They're loosely tied together. Okay. Does that sort of answer your question? So you're saying that the image should be one or the other? Or well, it could be both. Uh, if your images are super large, then that will be slow down the loading of your site, whereas the parallax usually doesn't get started until the page is loaded, that, the system that powers that. So usually these are at two different stages of loading, depending on how the parallax system is built. Okay. So that just it really depends on the exact system. But usually, it's images come in, get loaded, and then parallax. Unless you have some other features we'll get to in just a moment. But it, so they're not always inherently tied together. Okay. Yes? Um, not to, images are like the number one easiest thing for any of us to fix. With, mm -hmm. And we still need to do all the other stuff. But, um, and not to give people permission to just put those 5,000 pixel wide images. But I want to say since WordPress 4.4, they've done that source set Mm -hmm. So it'll, and you could still potentially load things that are too big, but it will do the set and pick the smaller ones. And the other thing is, uh, hit me up or I'll try to tune you out, but I just wrote this whole, all this bossy stuff about, we don't need these images that big, so I'll put that on. The, the source set's a good point. That's a little bit technical, so I don't want to dive into that right this second. The issue is, it, it is, except the themes have to actually use it the right way, and the plugins have to use it the right way. So I wouldn't rely on that. Yeah, so theoretically, that one should be good. But doesn't mean all the plugins you have that are displaying images are good. So that would be something to consider there. But, so when it comes to image, but thank you for that great point. 
So when it comes to images, if you're asking how to get smaller files, the very first step is just smaller dimensions. That's usually the massive part. So if you have something that's 5,000 pixels wide, and you only need probably like six or 700 pixels, just reducing the size of the image, the dimensions, will massively cut down the size of the image. So there's a few different ways you could do that. If you have Photoshop on your computer, that's not everyone does. But you could even use like Paint. You could use um, GIMP, G-I-M-P. That's a free tool as well. There's a lot of different photo editor tools just to shrink the image down. Now, within WordPress, they have a few different, like you can crop and scale and stuff. So you could do a little bit there. If you have a lot of images, it'd be a real pain to do it that way. But technically, there's some tools built into WordPress as well. Now, from there, the second step of, yes, ma'am? There are free tools online where you can bulk edit and make them all smaller at once. My brother's a realtor, a lot of photographs. <laughs> <laughs> so we use that. Yes, sir. I don't always have like 72 GBI of a filter right next to it. That's a whole technical conversation. It really depends on a lot of factors that you're after. Are you asking about like the screen resolution or just what you should be aiming for? So it really depends on what you're trying to put up. If you're putting up like icons and stuff like that, then it, but you know, 72 is good to get started. A um, couple, what's the, the high Mac? I want to say they're higher. I want to say it's like 150 or 300 or that high one. I don't know that number off the top of my head. I'm not. Yeah, but they're higher version. They have that really new high one. What is it, 300? Yeah, 360. Yeah, it's up there. So it really depends on what you're after and what you're trying to display. But that would be another factor as well. Now, naturally, the higher the, the image sizes will correlate as well. Now, so to piggyback on quality on there then, the lower the quality is, the smaller the file. Now, obviously, you don't want to upload an image that's like terrible looking. So I'm not saying, like, oh, make it the worst quality ever so save space. That's not what I'm saying. But when it comes to quality of a file, and you can do this in a lot of photo editors or some photo editing tools online as well, and WordPress has a somewhat OK tool. So most visitors, if you look at most of the conversion studies and studies that are done on this, most visitors, visitors can't even tell the difference on most images between 70% and 100% quality. Now, those percentages are as the percentage of quality. So 100% is like the normal image. And then decreasing the quality down by 30% would be that, where's that 70% number come from? And most visitors can't tell the difference on most images. So there's not, there's not reason in all ways to use 100%. Unless your focus is like you need super high quality photos in a certain setting, then you might want to only decrease a little bit or not at all. But in most cases, it would be better to decrease it a little bit and to save all that extra sa um, processing time and loading time. Does that make sense? A little bit? Yes, sir. I was going to just chime in and say that for, um, if you don't want to edit the files on Photoshop or an image editor, you can download uh, the M7 plugin, which will set, you can set like a size resolution on the on the photos to prevent like end users from uploading five thousand pixel wide images. You can probably set it to like a thousand or even eight hundred pixels wide or by six hundred pixels high. And you could also pair that up with Adobe Suite Premiership. Well, that's plugin. actually about to get to there. But yeah the if you have clients or you have end users that would be a great suggestion that first that we mentioned because they will not listen to what you say. You can tell your client or your users, be like, hey, like, aim for this. And they'll, you'll go on, and it'll be like 50 megabyte images. So any tool that restricts them is always a good one to use, definitely. What was the name of the one you recommended? So like if the like the end user doesn't know how big their image is on their camera, so no, we just set it so they can't change it. Yeah. <laughs> so you can so you can upload it and you don't you don't give them a choice. Uh, it'll it'll shrink it automatically to dimensions that are in favor of them. All right, and we're almost out of time, so let's just get to the last couple of slides and then we'll regroup on that. So I just want to mention there's are tools that help with this optimization process. So um, WP Smush it's now called Smush Image Compression and Optimization. It's a really long mouthful of a name because I don't remember. They just recently changed the name, I want to say. But that was one of the tools. This is a plugin that you can use on your WordPress site. The caveat there with plugins, you're going to find a lot of plugins that do this. The issue is that this is running on your WordPress site. So it's taking up resources and processing power. So if you have a lot of images or you're doing a lot of stuff, 
it could affect some of your performance of your website. So that would be the caveat to throw there. Now an external service is Kraken.io. This one's not free. The first one's free. The second one's not free. So depending on what you're after. But Kraken.io, I want to start. It starts off at fairly cheap. I want to say like ten dollars a month, fifteen somewhere in there. And so what that'll do is when you upload the image, it gets sent to Kraken. They will do all the processing and then they send it back. That way the processing is not happening on your WordPress site, slowing your site down. So that just depends on where you're at and what you're trying to do. That'd be two things that you want to consider there. So. Since we're almost out of time, I'll just bring up a couple of these real fast. Optimizations. So when it comes to a lot of the caching stuff that I mentioned earlier, there's a few other things that kind of play in that that could be a little bit technical. So I just want to briefly touch on those. So the first, the main two is concatenation and minification. So when it comes to all the different things on your site, every plugin probably has its own styles. The theme has its own styles. They all have their own scripts. And they're probably all over the place with file sizes and what there's, what's going on in them. So these two steps is the process of condensing those files down and sometimes combining them into much smaller versions of themselves. So that's not something, if you're not technical, it's not something you probably do yourself. But there's a lot of plugins that do this. And even most of the caching plugins, the three I mentioned earlier, W3 Total Cache, Super Cache, and Breeze, they both have an option that you can turn on to enable this process. The caveat there is that not all plugins and themes will work well with these processes. So it's something you would want to test and make sure everything still works when you turn it on, and then if not, turn it back off. So that would be a caveat to consider there. Now, if you're not using a caching plugin, if you're using maybe their server cache, maybe your host doesn't want you to use caching plugins, you could use the auto or auto optimize plugin. There's, there's only one O in there, and I always say it wrong. I don't know how they actually say it. But that plugin does this set for you without all the actual, actual caching process. So that would be a plugin to consider. It's actually really good. That would be a good one to use if you want to use these and not the caching components. So last, we have about a minute left. So last slide. So this is the keep your site tidy. So if you log into your site and you look at maybe your comment section and you see there's about 70,000 spam comments, or you look at some of your other content and there's all this extra content all over the place, this isn't, each one of those doesn't massively slow down your site. But when you're talking about hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands, these are all in the database. And how WordPress works is there's a database that stores all this data. And when it goes to pull out this data, it has to go through this database to find the right data. So, and most of these are very fast transactions. We're talking about fragments of a millisecond. So it's not usually something to worry about. But when you have so much of something, it does have to go through all of those to find the things it's after. So it can inherently slow down your site. Not by much. This is probably something you do towards the end or just something you do over time. Just keep it up. But it's something to consider if you have a massive amount of spam comments or a massive amount of anything in there, it is extra things it has to go through, slowing your site down. Does that make sense? And so last, I just want to bring up a slide of all the tools I mentioned. The only one I didn't mention is WP Sweep. This is a really handy one that you install and then deactivate and get rid of. What this does is it goes through the database and finds things that were created by plugins or themes you no longer use and tries to remove some of that content. So that's a nice plugin to toss in there as well. That one's called WP-Sweep. Can everyone see that OK? Is that, do I need to move out of the way? OK. And I want to say that's my last slide. So uh, um, I don't think we have time for questions. I think we have like. A minute. Frank, are you going to be around at all? Yeah, I'll be around here. Tomorrow? Tomorrow? I'm, here. I'm here all weekend. So. Frank is here all weekend, so if you have any specific questions, um, good job. Very important uh, issue. All right. Thank you, everyone.